Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you all could be here tonight. I'm uh, Ann Kruger. I'm the president of the Grossmont Mount Helix Improvement Association. And uh, our organization is sponsoring this along with the Casa de Oro Alliance. Uh, we're both community organizations uh, trying to improve our areas. And one of the best ways you can improve your neighborhood is by uh, being informed about the elected officials uh, that you have. Uh, I want to thank our two candidates, uh, Monica and Amy, for being here tonight. Uh, this really gets yeah, yeah. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ann. Um, hello, my name is Dana Freehoff, and I'm a proud member of the League of Women Voters of San Diego. And I will be, moder I will be the moderator um, for this evening's candidate forum for San Diego County Board of Supervisor District 4. So you're, you, if you're in District 4, um, you should have already received your ballots. Um, they went out in the mail on October 8th um, to all registered voters in District 4. Election day is November 7th. And this is a special election um, to fill a District 4 vacant seat for the remainder of the current term ending January of 2027. This is a forum, this forum, excuse me, is an opportunity for the community yourselves to ask the questions you care most about and a chance for the candidates to explain their positions. It's a forum for the voters. It is not a debate um, between the candidates. Um, I would like to thank the candidates, uh, Monica um, Montgomery Stepp and Amy Record for attending. Thank you. Uh, but most importantly, and I, I want to thank all of you for coming and becoming an informed voter. Um, I'd also like to say that the League of Women Voters is proud to be nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties, um, but we're always working on vital issues of concern to members of the public. So as part of our mission to educate voters, the League moderates candidate forums using a format that is fair and informative. The candidates have all agreed to this format in advance. So I'm just going to take a little time to review the format for this evening. So candidates will each have two minutes for their opening statement, and then two minutes for their closing statements, and then three minutes to respond to each question from the audience. There'll be a timekeeper. We have Vicki here in the front row with her paddles. So she will, she'll be making sure that the candidates stay within their time frame. Um, and then, oh, this is really, this is important. Um, we'd like you to please hold all applause until the forum is finished to really ensure that there's an adequate time for candidates to respond to the questions. Now there's one final item, and this is important too. Since the candidate forum is designed to provide a nonpartisan setting for undecided voters to hear all positions, any demonstrations of support or opposition to the candidates or their positions will be out of order. Um, and unheeded warnings may result in the cancellation of the forum. So the League is very proud to have a nonpartisan setting where candidates have an opportunity to state their positions. So uh, again, no um, cheering, no clapping until we're at the end of the forum. We'd really appreciate it. All right, so I think we will get started. And we'll start with our opening statements um, from our candidates. And at random, um, we will begin with um, candidate um, Reichert. All right. I like to start tonight off by asking you a question. By a show of hands, how many of you have lived in San Diego County for 10 years? Keep them up 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. All right, I see some 70s. Well, I've been here since I was four years old, so I have been here for 51 years, so you can do the math. And I grew up right here in Tirasana. I was adopted when I was a baby by a very loving mom and dad. My mom was a secretary, and my dad worked at FedMart. How many of you remember FedMart? Yes. So when I was about eight years old, that's when my dad was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He was no longer able to work, and my mom became the simultaneous caregiver and breadwinner for me and my two younger brothers. I'm very grateful that we were able to get Social Security disability. 
to able to help my, my family in that safety net. I became the first person in my family to graduate college. I graduated from San Diego State University. I went on to find my biological mother before Google, and then that's when I figured out that I would want to become a state licensed private investigator. And so I've had my license since 1999, and I've been a successful businesswoman, Amy Reichert Investigations. So fast forward to the past few years. Well, I have a 24-year-old son and I have a 12-year-old son. And so in 2020, it was late 2020, that's when I founded a nonprofit that advocated for the safe reopening of schools, the safe reopening of churches, and the safe reopening of businesses. And then my nonprofit went on to file a federal lawsuit defending the religious civil liberties of over 2,000 San Diego city workers. And we won that federal lawsuit this year. So here we are at a special election, and we're at a crossroads. Everybody that raised your hands, I can't wait to hear your questions this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you, candidate Eckert. Um, candidate uh, Montgomery Stout. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of the partners uh, for getting us together in this beautiful venue this evening. I'm very excited about it being uh, election time for, for this race. And just a reminder, everyone has until November 7th to vote. Um, I'm Monica Montgomery Steph. I currently serve as the council member for the fourth council district in the city of San Diego. I was born and raised in San Diego. Uh, my parents um, raised us to know the value of hard work. My mom is a real estate broker and my father owns a construction company and she mostly helps him with that instead of doing her, her broker's work. Um, and so again, they raised us with the, with the value of, of hard work. I'm the oldest of three children. I have two younger brothers and we were really taught to, um, to serve. Uh, we grew up in, in church and my family um, had roots in about three churches here in, in San Diego and a lot of our value system um, comes from that. So as a council member, I have been able to generate over $100 million of investment into my council district as chair of the Budget and Government Efficiency Committee at the city. I've been able to shepherd the council through um, the budget process, which is a $5.2 billion budget. I've been focused on first-time home ownership at the city of San Diego. We were one out of eight cities to receive a grant from Wells Fargo um, in order to provide down payment assistance for first-time home buyers. And I've also really worked a lot in building trust between community members and police officers. One program that I championed is called the No Shots Fired program, and it uh, reduced gang homicide in our community by 65 percent um, over one year's time. And so this is the type of experience that I'm looking forward to bringing at, to the county and really keeping the community and people at the center of the solutions that I propose. Looking forward to hearing from you this evening. All right, thank you for your opening remarks. Um, so now it is time for the candidates to answer your questions. Each candidate will have up to three minutes for their responses. So the first question, we'll start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. What's the most important role of the county supervisor and how are you best fit to fill that position? Yeah, I think the most important role is um, when we look at the budget, the budget is uh, $8.1 billion. And the majority of that budget is in the um, health and human services arena. So the main job of a county board of supervisors is to make sure that the people of San Diego have the resources and the social services that they need. So in health and human services, it encompasses encompasses the foster care system, it encompasses uh, behavioral health and mental health services. So many of the issues that we are facing in our region, the county has the infrastructure to help solve a lot of those issues. I think a couple additional roles, I think, of any elected official is to make sure that they are an independent voice for the people. Um, I was endorsed by the San Diego Union and Tribune, and that was one of their attributes. They said that I had an independent voice and I maintained that voice. And so when I talk about a community governance model, 
I mean bringing the community's voice to the table. Some community folks have not quite been at that table and using that voice to um, solve our issues and bring the solutions that our community members bring to us through the bureaucracy. It's extremely important for elected officials to be able to provide a check and balance on the bureaucracy to ensure that the programs that we are bringing forward are actually working for the people. So, you know, it is a, a tough job. I would say another um, main role and job of a county board of supervisors is to ensure that they are working with the federal government Government, the state government, which is where um, the, the county receives the majority of its funding, and also the unincorporated areas and the cities within the entire county, and to provide support to them. So it's a very well-rounded position. Um, it has a lot of responsibility, and based on the track record that um, I have been able to um, institute um, and my reputation, I truly believe that the experience that I would bring to this county seat will uh, help us move forward and deal with a lot of the critical issues that we are facing now, a main one being homelessness and then housing. So I'm ready to, to do that uh, for you all, uh, particularly here in the East County, but also for the entire Supervisorial District. All right, so um, candidate Reichert, again the question, what's the most important role of the county supervisor and how are you best fit to fill that position? The most important role of a county supervisor is to serve the people. If you look at the county website, you can see the org chart for the county of San Diego and it's the people who are at the top, then the board of supervisors. Well, many people over the past few years just do not believe that the county is living up to its own org chart. And people have not been seen or heard or they don't feel like their elected officials even care about them. And so essentially what a San Diego County Board of Supervisor, like big overview, is public health and public safety. So let's talk about public safety. Public safety, uh, we're in a crisis right now with our Sheriff's Department. In this area in particular, it's not the San Diego Police Department that polices this area, it's the Sheriff's Department. And right now our Sheriff's Department is understaffed by 250 deputies. And the same goes for our jails too. Our jails are short staffed. And there we're seeing Sheriff's deputies that are working mandatory overtime. And as a result, we're also having a crisis in our jails that's unacceptable with increasing inmate deaths overdoses and suicides. And so that brings me to the second thing that's so important for San Diego County Board of Supervisors, public health. We all know that when it comes to public health, mental health is a crisis right now. We're seeing it on our streets, in our jails, on our sidewalks, and in our schools, and in our very homes, especially with our kids. Part of my story is when I was 30 years old, I was eight months pregnant with my first child. And that's when my dad, who was only 56 years old, died of complications from multiple sclerosis. Five weeks later, after a completely normal pregnancy, my daughter Ashley was born in a coma. And she only lived for three days. And after that, I was one of those people that suffered a crisis. I was diagnosed with major depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the sadness was so bottomless that sadly I turned to alcohol. Fortunately, I was able to get connected to celebrate recovery, and I've been sober for the past 20 years. Oh, you're not allowed to click. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> See, they're being good at all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for obeying the rules. So I come into this role with a core lived experience issue regarding mental health and addiction, which are out of control right now. It's the worst we've ever seen it in San Diego County. So you can count on me in the first 100 days to do several things and stop. <laughs> we'll talk about that more later. All right, thank you. 
Um, so our next question, and um, I'm going to be going back and forth so the candidates have equal time to who goes first, who goes second type of thing. Um, so this then um, candidate record, this one will go to you. Um, and get ready, it's a long one. Okay, the Grossmont, Mount Helix, Casa de Oro communities are the largest areas of the district, fourth district. As the fourth district supervisor, you will be the only elected official mm -hmm. to provide municipal type services to these residents. How do you plan to remain in close contact with your constituents to represent their needs and desires to the full board of supervisors? How I have campaigned is how I will govern. And how I have campaigned is by showing up in the community. I live in La Mesa myself, and I've been to many of the community planning groups. How many of you are in a community planning group? I know I saw many of you in the foyer. Thank you so much for serving the community. And I think what the disconnect has been so far is when people do reach out to their county supervisor. And for the unincorporated areas, the county supervisor is that city council person for that area. What they've heard from their supervisor is crickets. Or they get a form letter. They get a copy and paste. And part of my history, too, is not only did I get sober, but I co-led a thriving Celebrate Recovery, where I've led thousands of people to recovery. And how I was in that space as a leader, a servant leader, people could call me at 12 midnight if they needed a bed to get sober, and I would be on the phone until 2 a.m. making sure that they had a place to go. And anybody that has sent me an email or sent me a text, you know I am a super responder. I respond quick. And so that's what we really need. I'm, I'm not a politician. I just come in here. I'm a mom who decided to get active in the past couple years. What I've seen in the past few years is San Diego County in decline. I've never seen homelessness worse. I've never seen our housing crisis worse. Mental health, addiction, I mean, you name it. By every metric, people are very concerned about the quality of life here in San Diego County. So what I will bring to this position is a fresh perspective. I'm not beholden to any special interest whatsoever. Um, there's something called PACs, and PACs can give hundreds of thousands of dollars to candidates. I'm happy to say that I've had zero PAC money in this race. And so I can walk into this office absolutely beholden to no one except for the people of San Diego County. So I look forward to more of your questions and hearing your heart about what you see as the vision and the future of San Diego County. Candidate Montgomery Stepp, just real quickly, how do you plan well, not real quickly, you have three minutes, but I mean, how, I'm shortening the question. How do you plan um, to remain in close contact with your constituents here in this region and the unincorporated area um, to represent their needs and desires to the full board of supervisors? Yes, yeah, so I want to go back a little bit uh, in my history and how I uh, became a council member. So, um, when I ran in one in 2018, I ran um, against all of the establishments. <laughs> so no party endorsed me. Um, I think two labor um, organizations endorsed me. None of the business community endorsed me, but it was the community members from all over the region that came together and knocked on doors and talk to voters about me. I was also, you know, I'm a third generation San Diegan as well. So we were able to really pull from our, a, lot of, a lot of our relationships that people knew that we were a family of service. Um, but my point is that when I won that race and shocked the entire um, political um, elite, I will say, um, Every day I walked into that building, City Hall, I felt like I was carrying the 20,000 people that got me there. And since then, I have structured my office in a way 
that no matter what is going on in our communities, we have 18 community councils, 18 neighborhoods. Each one of them has a community council. We have four community planning groups just in the district. And my um, staff members, along with myself, um, they, my staff members work more regularly because folks meet every month. And you know, as an elected, you have you know, and you have to do governing things, you know, to make sure that the community is is receiving the resources that they need. But setting up that office in a way where we put our communities first, I already have an infrastructure for that. And I understand that when I am talking to folks in the unincorporated areas in particular, people feel like they have been left out of the process. And so taking that, that spirit of understanding what it is to be left out and to feel left out, um, we already have that in my office. And so the experience bringing that to your communities would be a no-brainer uh, for us because we're doing that work every single day. And I will never leave that work, no matter how hard it gets. And we get a lot of times in our community council meetings there, they don't go so well, right? Um, but we are there. And sometimes we are the only elected office that shows up because we that's how important it is and that's how I got into the seat in the first place. So it would be absolutely no different. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, though, goes back to um, candidate Montgomery Stepp. How do you plan to address health care access in San Diego County? Well, the, the county is the public health agency of the region. I think probably everybody here knows that. And so when we are talking about access, we are talking about reducing barriers for people, especially people who do not have um, health care by means of their jobs or um, you know, through a part of their retirement. We're talking about some of our most vulnerable community members um, when it comes to access and reducing barriers. Uh, I think that you know, as, as bad as the pandemic was and, and so many things that we went through, we did develop some models in order to serve our most vulnerable communities and picking up um, many of those, those models to be able to make sure that people still have access um, is ex extremely important. I know that um, the federal government um, within San Diego County has funded quite a few community clinics. So to be able to provide that type of health care where anyone who needs it can receive it um, within our communities is very, very important. That does require relationships on those levels, which I, which I have, um, and definitely willing to use them so that everyone can receive the health care that they need. Um, I will use um, the, the newest Live Well Center as an example that we have in our community. It was a, um, an $80 million investment from the county, and it does have um, um, offices, public health offices. It does have uh, mental health offices in that community building um, now, and it was, we just, um, we just uh, had the grand opening a few weeks ago. Those are the types of uh, community uh, centers and buildings that we need to ensure that we are reducing the barriers for people who need um, health care the most. I also want to just talk briefly um, as we are digging into a lot of our um, issues around homelessness and people who uh, need services for addiction and also need services for mental health. There is a structure, reimbursement structure, that is not um, benefiting some of our hospitals that provide that care. It's not benefiting them well. So uh, working with the state and the county to ensure that the reimbursement structure is one that does not yet provide another barrier for people, I think is something that we haven't talked about much, but it is a really, really big deal um, when we're talking about public health and also mental health services. So there's a lot that we can do to um, reduce barriers. Some of it is just getting through the red tape, um, and I'm looking forward to, to doing that work. 
All right, thank you. Um, candidate Record, how do you plan to address health care access in San Diego County? There are some great community organizations who are already in various communities like San Ysidro Health. And what I believe what the county can do is link arms with these existing community clinics that are already in communities and help them by getting federal grants and state grants as well. Now, when it comes to mental health, though, here is what we need to do with what the county actually is allocating funds towards. So right now in San Diego County, a lot of people don't realize there's something called a crisis stabilization unit, a CSU. And what that is, is it's an urgent care where people who are experiencing a mental health crisis can go for absolutely free without a referral and without an appointment and they can get the help that they need. The other thing that the county is doing is called the mobile crisis response teams. And what they are doing is, it's fantastic. These teams, they're not staffed with law enforcement. So people from the community, loved ones, family members, if they are concerned about a loved one, they can call this 800 number and the mobile crisis response team will come and help this person in crisis. We've had a lot of success with these teams. There's roughly about 30 of them right now in San Diego County, and I would like to see that doubled. Now, there are situations where law enforcement does need to be involved because somebody might be uh, threatening suicide and they might have a weapon. And so that's the psychiatric response teams. And so when those teams come out, uh, they're able to actually help the family members, uh, with somebody who might be threatening their life with a, a gun, for example, and help them get the mental help that they need. We need to expand those teams as well. Now, one of the things that hospital group leaders are saying that is a real issue right here in San Diego County is we don't have enough psychiatric beds. In San Diego County, we have 742 psychiatric beds for a population of 3.3 million. And Hospital leaders say that we need to double that number at least. We don't have a real-time tracking system either. So if somebody needs a psychiatric bed, then they have to call various facilities to get one. We need a real-time tracking system, and that's something that I would do in my first 100 days. So right now what we really need to concentrate on is mental health and access to public health. And I believe that that can be achieved sensibly with existing groups that are already in the communities and helping them get grants and funding and making sure that we are deliberately spending money on mental health on evidence-based programs. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next question, and we'll start with candidate record again. AB 1033 was passed this week, which allows homeowners to sell an ADU built on their property. Communities, cities, assuming the county, must opt in to put this law into effect. What is your position on AB 1033, opt in or out? And if you have no opinion yet, what do you see as the pros and cons? So I've heard loud and clear from the community about concerns about ADUs and also another Senate bill called SB 10. So in, in this case, with this particular Senate bill and with ADUs, my concern would be, okay, the ADU that's in the backyard, who can it be sold to? Can it be sold to a corporation? And then we might possibly see Wall Street owning huge swaths of residential neighborhoods. If you are familiar with SB 10, will you raise your hand? SB 10 is very similar to this in that cities would have to opt in. Thankfully, no cities have in this county. And so under SB 10, what can happen is your next door neighbor can sell their home, a corporation can come in, bulldoze that home, and build a 10-unit apartment building with two additional ADUs, and there's no parking that's set into the law, and there's no setbacks. So again, my huge concern would be that it's the dream of every person to realize the American dream, to own a home. 
And what we're seeing in the past few years is 50,000 people have left this county so that they can afford a single family home in other states. A lot of people are really shocked by that. Yes, our population has declined according to county numbers. And so my answer to this question about ADUs is when it is in regards to somebody taking their property and then splitting it off, I would really want to know, considering SB 10 is the gator that's in the water, could that also possibly mean that somebody could sell that ADU to a corporation? They could actually tear down that ADU if SB 10 came up, and then what would happen is you would have uh, apartment buildings built there that are for rent and not for sale. So uh, thank you to the person who brought up to that, that question, and I share your concerns. And I w just want to make sure that our communities are protected. I believe that at the community level, it is communities that should decide how their communities look like, not Wall Street. Thank you. All right, thank you, candidate Montgomery Stepp. What is your position on AB 1033, opt-in or out? And if you have no opinion yet, what do you see as the pros and cons? So um, I have um, heard of the bill. I haven't read it in its entirety, in its final passage. But what I do know about the advocates of the bill, uh, some of them being real estate um, agent broker associations, is that there is, of course, a push for more people to be a part of home ownership. And that is extremely important to me. In my introduction, I talked about um, uh, receiving grant funding from Wells Fargo Bank it, to the tune of $7 million, specifically to help first-time homeowners with down payment assistance, assistance and to set up an infrastructure where we are helping people own their own homes, especially for the first time. We know that across the nation, but especially here in California, that is a way that people can build wealth. And so it's a very, very important to me. There, we've done other efforts as well, working on helping um, first time home, home uh, buyers. So I think that I have to go with the intent first. That was the intent. I don't, you know, although the corporations do find loopholes oftentimes, um, the intent of this bill, especially from hearing from the advocates of the bill, is to open up home ownership for more people in our region. That I will always support. However, um, there are unintended consequences of some of the bills. Um, we dealt with this with SB9 um, that, you know, allowed for on the construction of eight, uh, more ADUs um, with not a lot of limits on um, what people would be able to, to charge for rent. So we're finding that um, as these units are being developed, the rent is extremely high and it's impacting the neighborhoods in that way. Um, but I think that in this day and time, we have enough knowledge at the table to be able to craft legislation that will help open up the opportunity to more people to own own homes. That's what this bill was all about. And um, in that way, I do certainly support that intent. Um, opting in, you know, I don't I don't know that yet because I would have to do um, certainly additional research. But I just want to be on the record that I do support um, having uh, home ownership open to as many people as possible, especially in California and especially now, because what we have right now is a crisis of middle income homes. That's what we have right now. People are not able to move up um, because we don't have enough housing that would fit that uh, area median income. So I do support that intent. Um, the next question then, we'll start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. What is your plan to clean up our neighborhoods and get rid of trash, graffiti, homelessness, people living in RVs? That's quite a list. Um, so that, that was the question. Okay. I really want to hit each one, right? <laughs> 
So um, I talked a lot about our uh, community advocacy uh, currently as a council member and some of the things that I'm looking forward to taking into the unincorporated areas. One is our uh, community cleanup that we have that is quarterly. We partner with Edco and a lot of the other um, uh, companies in order to have our neighbors and our residents come to one place to be able to dump a lot of the things, mattresses, tires, they can get rid of electronics, anything that they have. Um, we provide that service because it takes, you know, it takes money to have to go to the dump. Uh, so we provide that service for free quarterly for our residents and it ha has helped clean up our neighborhoods and our communities. So certainly instituting something like that for these areas, um, I would be looking forward to, to doing for sure. Um, same thing with graffiti. You know, graffiti, especially if it's on uh, public property, it takes less time to get rid of it. And we know with graffiti, the sooner you get rid of it, the better. Um, and then folks end up not doing it or, you know, going somewhere else, which is still a problem. But in our communities, the faster we can provide that service, the better it is for our residents. We have certainly found that. There is complication when we talk about private ownership of, of private buildings, but, you know, working with and having a public-private partnership when it comes to graffiti is extremely important. The main thing is to, to get it down as soon as it comes up, and that's, that's extremely important. Um, homelessness, certainly uh, there are, um, especially you know with encampments, because people are utilizing um, encampments for the things that they would have had in their own home, um, that, that does pr produce uh, quite a bit of, of debris um, on our streets. That is, that is a tough one. And there are some cities that have um, designated certain areas for people to be able to to, to camp um, and provided specific uh, ways that the trash can be thrown away. Um, but this is all, you know, a part of having strong constituency services because that's what it, it really is all about. And it is also you you pay for those services. You pay uh, taxpayer dollars to ensure that your government is um, keeping places clean. The last thing that I'll say is that I remember um, when I was I 15 seconds, way back in the day when I was in elementary school, there was a campaign. There was a campaign um, to encourage people not to loiter. And I haven't seen that in a while. And I think something like that is needed right now would be extremely successful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so candidate uh, Riker, uh, what is your plan to clean up our neighborhoods, get rid of trash, graffiti, homelessness, and people living in RVs? One of the biggest compliments that I got while I've been running for office here is when somebody contacts me through email and they say, Amy, I have this issue, can you help? And so they're already turning to you and they're already asking me to help them out with the community issue. And it was right here in East County. And it was somebody just off of Campo Road and there was an overgrown Calvert. And they had gotten the runaround from the county and from the state. And I was able to return their call within 15 minutes and help them get that problem started, uh, stopped. So here's the thing, you know, we have such a toxic political culture right now. And this is a nonpartisan office. At the end of the day, we don't want to have a supervisor who is going to politicize every single issue, right, on the board. What we really, really need is somebody that's going to fix the potholes in East County. There's somebody that's going to take care of the trash, somebody that's going to take care of the graffiti. And I can see a, a couple ways that we can do that. Number one, we need to have uh, enforcement of businesses. I have gone on trash pickup days at the Lemon in Lemon Grove, in Hillcrest at the Pride Flag, in La Mesa in the Village, and in Rolando as well on Rolando Boulevard. And as I've picked up trash in these different areas, I've even found syringes uh, on these trash pickups. What I'm seeing is there's a lot of businesses who are not taking care of their own parking lots. 
And so you'll see a lot of trash right in front of businesses. So there has to be accountability for businesses to actually clean up their own business areas. Now, uh, when it comes to homelessness, I do have a plan. It's called Shelter First with Treatment. And although I won't be able to go into it in depth today, what I believe the most compassionate thing that we can do is we can say, no, it, we love you too much to let you sleep and die on our streets. We've only seen our encampments grow by just having an, a lax attitude. So I heard this the other night, and I fully believe it, that if you truly love somebody, there's some accountability there. And so when it comes to our parks, or in front of our schools, or in front of our businesses, I think it's perfectly fine, and I think it's an act of love to say that, no, you cannot camp here. And so what we need immediately is more shelters. Because what we're seeing with the encampments, again, what's happening is we're, a, a mom just told me that she, her child stepped on feces, had to step around syringes. So um, in, in closing, what I really want to say is um, uh, these encampments actually cause a lot of trash in neighborhoods, and we really need to help these people get shelter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I guess we go on to our next question now, and that is, ooh, here we go. Um, will you support efforts to find funding and expedite construction of the 94 slash 125 interchange? Go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I actually drive that interchange every single day. My son goes to school in Spring Valley, and so that interchange is a nightmare. Raise your hand if you drive it on a regular basis. There's accidents all the time. It's backed up. And on an environmental level, when you have that kind of congestion going on there, it's bad for the environment. I went to a meeting that was uh, in La Mesa, and it was put on by Caltrans. And there were just as many people in that room as there are here tonight. And let's, let's face it, residents have been waiting for over a decade for this to happen. And really, I think this is a failure of Sandag as well, because <laughs> voters passed the transnet tax. And we all passed that, and it's part of the sales tax, with the idea that that money would go to road infrastructure. But here's what's really happening. Two thirds of that transnet tax is being spent on bike lanes and public transportation. I do believe that we need to make public transportation safer, more convenient, more accessible, so people want to take it. But right now, only 4% of San Diego County residents actually even take public transportation at all. And so what I would do if elected as supervisor is I would hold Sandag accountable and I would make sure that not one more dime of our taxpayer money is spent until they start putting money into our roads and to fix the 94-125 interchange for good. Um, candidate Montgomery Stepp, will you support efforts to find funding and expedite construction of the 94-125 interchange? Yes. I can feel the people wanted to clap there, so I, I know. feel Thank it. You. It's, okay. it's good. Okay, it's so good. <laughs> just, just being obedient. We, we love it. Um, yes, absolutely. So, yes, this uh, interchange was a part of, it's been a part of the regional transportation plan. Um, community members have been waiting for it for a very, very long time. The, the one thing that I'll say is that um, as we do add uh, more roads, um, more lanes, then you know the research does show us that it does cause more congestion, right? So as we uh, do what was promised to the people, because it was promised, we also need to add other multimodal ways to, to get around that are more convenient for folks. And there are a lot of ways to do that. 
Um, and so we have to, I think, in this time, have to have to kind of do both because it's not going to happen overnight where we find convenient ways to, to get around. And people, you know, California, San Diego is car-centric. We, we love our cars. I, you know, I do too. And I drive um, that 94, 125 interchange quite a bit, and it doesn't matter what time of day. It is extremely congested and crowded. So, yes, um, it is certainly a priority to find funding for that. Um, we, uh, again, just have to keep in mind that as we move forward, we, we do have mandates that the state has given us um, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We have um, many things that we have to follow, so um, keeping those things in mind I think is important as we move forward, and that's not um, a popular conversation, um, but you know it is where we are right now, and I really am thinking about you know the future, I'm thinking about you know, people who we are trying to get to stay in San Diego, we're losing a lot of talent. Um, but I'm thinking about people who want to stay here and, and keeping our air clean and keeping this the beautiful San Diego that we know that it can be. And kind of balancing both priorities is, is very, very important. All right, thank you. All right, our next question from the audience. Um, and we'll start with candidate Montgomery Step. What is your experience in working with and engaging diverse communities in solving community problems? Yeah, that's a good question. I think my, my life's work is working with diverse communities and depending on community to be able to solve the, problem, the problems that we face. One of the things I hear a lot and I agree with is that the people that are closest to the pain are closest to the solution. And so I um, just governed that way prior to being in office. You know, I worked with um, homeowners, fought against the banks during the foreclosure crisis, crisis so that folks could keep their homes. I worked as a staff member. I have not always been an elected official. <laughs> I, I worked as a staff member for three different elected officials on either side of the aisle. Um, I also worked at the ACLU um, leading a campaign. Where I was working with um, mothers and daughters and sons and fathers in the bail reform campaign to make sure that we were breaking the cycle of poverty and providing pathways for people to be able to be contributors of society um, instead of being a drain to society. So in all of those things, I have been community-centered and rooted and always looking to solving problems. As a matter of fact, you know, the, the bureaucracy is not necessarily built for that type of governance, but we have created a model called our community governance model, where we engage stakeholders in a very formal way. And we take them through the process of writing what would be a board letter at the county um, and ordinance in, in our cities um, and taking their ideas through the process. It's, it's extremely important to me and it has been um, my life's work. When I talk about the program that, that our champion, No Shots Fired, that is working with um, law enforcement. That is a part of uh, the, uh, the gang detectives, um, the assistant chiefs in the police department, along with people who are former gang members. And working that the only way that we could reduce violence was by them working together. You talk about diversity in one group working together, though they're on opposite sides of the aisle. But because we have a common goal, all of us want to feel safe, all of us want opportunity for ourselves or for our children or for our grandchildren, all of us want safe parks, all of us want clean neighborhoods, and taking those overarching goals putting people together and kind of figuring it out and understanding that we all have different experiences in life, really that's what, what I've done and why I think that I've been able to be successful with most communities um, that I speak to, that I work for, that I work with, um, within the city and within the region. All right, thank you. So, candidate Reichert, what is your experience in working with and engaging diverse communities and solving community problems? 
How many of you are District 4 residents? District 4 is one of the most diverse districts in all of San Diego County. And one of the things that I have so enjoyed about, yes, running for office is being out in the community. Just this past weekend, I was invited to a Hindu festival at Balboa Park or the Chaldean Festival out in the East County just a few weeks ago. And I was invited to a moon festival at a Chinese church. And here's the thing, our diversity needs to be celebrated in San Diego. We're so divided right now. We really, it's, it's just, it's time for the political culture wars to end. It's time for people to come together and have a laser focus on the issue that are going on right now. So as supervisor, my office will also reflect diversity. 33% of District 4 is Latino. And so what I believe is very important is to have a Spanish speaker in District 4. Another population that also needs to be represented are people who speak Arabic. For my campaign materials, I have printed uh, materials in Arabic and Tagalog and Spanish and English. And it's very, very important that communities feel represented and they feel heard. As far as my experience in bringing people together, I founded a nonprofit and I referenced that earlier and it brought back, it brought people from all different walks of life. It was a nonpartisan group, and it was all based on freedom. And that's exactly the kind of leader I want to be. I want to bring people together. And that's why one of my core values during this race has been to never name call. And so I'm sure you've all seen uh, how I have uh, lived up to that promise. And so right now in San Diego, we are at a crossroads. We do need a change in direction, and we're all done with the Nathan Fletcher style politics that was so divisive. And you hopefully have heard my heart tonight and my desire to bring people together and never divide us. All right, thank you. And now for our final question. So we'll be wrapping it up, and we'll start with candidate Riker. The residents of the Grossmont, Mount Helix, Casa de Oro communities live here largely because of the quiet lifestyle than versus the crowded city neighborhoods that they often moved from. How do you plan to maintain the semi-rural lifestyles of these unincorporated communities? That is something that I've made part of my platform as a candidate. And I have gone to many different community planning groups everywhere from Valle de Oro to Emerald Hills to the college area. And here's what everybody is telling me, is that they want to be the ones making decisions for their own neighborhoods. And many people are just feeling powerless. When we're talking about the East County in, in particular, I believe that it is the community that should decide what the community looks like. Otherwise, why do we even have community planning groups? If Sacramento is going to be making all of the shots and all it takes is for a city to opt in, like SB 10, and then it's irreversible because that is what SB 10 says, I'm very concerned about that. So SB 9 would be the legislation that would affect the Grossmont Mount Helix area. And it is a semi-rural community, and I believe in protecting that community. Yes, we need housing, of course, but I, I am just, I'm just going to lay it all on the line. Um, I went into the meeting with the developers uh, to have a conversation with them, and I looked them in the eye, and I said, I will put the community first. And I'll never forget when their representative walked me to the elevator. She said, oh, well, that was refreshing. And I said, oh, how so? And she said, oh, because you told the truth. And I vow that I will always put the community first. It, we need to protect the magicalness that is Mount Helix. There are other places that we can build in San Diego County. We can build sensibly. Right now, what we've had in the past 20 years 
is we haven't been able to build sensibly, and I believe that we can do that and still protect the environment. And so what's happened, the unintended consequences of that is all of this huge sprawl in southern Riverside. How is that good for the environment? If people are living in Riverside and they're stuck on the 15 and they're just emitting all these greenhouse gases into the environment, it's not. It's not good. So we do need to look at building sensibly single family homes again, and that solves another problem. So people don't have to leave the state. So at the very core of my being, I believe that we cannot turn San Diego into Los Angeles or San Francisco. That is not a solution for our housing crisis. We can build sensibly, and we can do it while not destroying neighborhoods. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, um, candidate Montgomery Stepp, how do you plan to maintain the semi-rural lifestyle of these unincorporated communities? So, um, in this race, um, this issue has come up quite a bit, and I was the first person to go on record and say I'm absolutely against raw development. And I think that that is certainly a first step. Um, I also met with the developers and they um, did not like that uh, either. And so um, that's certainly a big first step in maintaining the character of the neighborhoods and the communities, in, especially in the unincorporated areas, but is also uh, good for our environment. Now, um, in the, the more urban parts, um, of the supervisorial district that would require the more urban parts to have more density. And that is how our, our climate action plans are usually built out. So that our areas that, you know, are semi-rural can kind of stay that way. Even if we build small, you know, villages, cities of villages to ensure that the unincorporated areas have the things that they need. But it really comes down to being against sprawl development. And that is going to be a continued fight at the county because, of course, the County Board of Supervisors make the, the land use decisions for the unincorporated areas. And there is more land to build in the unincorporated areas than there are in the more urban areas. So I've been on record from the very beginning um, against that type of development um, that will absolutely not change. Uh, but we, we do have to figure it out because as we talk about uh, you know, the, the legislation around ADUs, as we talk about SB 10 and all of uh, these other laws that are coming down from the state, we have a housing goal that we are supposed to meet a committee comes together, a committee that I was a part of, comes together every 10 years and determines how many units the region needs. And it's definitely, it's about 171,000 units over 10 years. And as we are dealing with our homelessness issues, housing is just a part of that conversation. Because either people leave or they end up on the street. And so in, in protecting our semi-rural areas, also our open spaces, extremely important and in line with our climate goals. Um, and we can get together and figure out how to build those units that we need um, in San Diego County. All right, thank you. All right, before our candidates um, give their closing remarks, I wanna give a big shout out to our audience and thank you so much for being such an attentive audience and for asking such great questions. Um, we apologize that we couldn't get all, to all the questions. We were limited to an hour. Um, we could have gone quite a bit longer. Um, but again, thank you so much for providing, providing the questions because that's what this forum is about. Um, remember some key dates. Again, um, ballots have already been mailed to those in San Diego County Div District 4, um, and the election date is November 7th. You can mail your ballot back, return it to one of the drop-off locations, or participate in the 10 days of early person voting. Go to sdvote.com and find your nearest voting location. So now for their closing remarks, 
remarks. Each candidate will have two minutes, and we will reverse the order. And so we'll begin with candidate Montgomery Smith. Well, thank you everyone again for being so engaged in this race. I would just leave you with this. I understand what it takes to fight against a bureaucracy for the people. And it is not easy. It's not. And you do need someone with the experience to do that and the proven track record to do that. My heart is for the people and my work shows it. When I was 20 years old at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune illness that affects my skin and muscles. I was waiting tables and by night and going to school by day. My parents were losing their business. My mom would send me a $5 bill in the mail because that's all that she had. And I had to come back home. I lost my ability to care for myself. My brother had to put me in a wheelchair and wheel me to the airplane. And when I got home, the only thing that I could do for myself was pick up a fork and feed myself. My family had to do everything else for me. And we had to apply for county services. And to be here in front of you right now telling that story and to have an opportunity to provide people with the dignity and respect that they deserve in their most vulnerable time, that is why I'm doing this. This is not about politics for me. I'm proud to have been endorsed by county workers that have put their trust in me. I'm proud to have been endorsed by nurses, California Nurses Association that have put their trust in me. But this is really about you. It's not about me. And so I'm grateful to be here at a community college that helped me get through that rough time in my life. Um, but I am just here to serve. And my story personally and professionally shows that I am a fighter and I will fight for you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, candidate uh, Riker. Thank you so much for being here. And I just wanna you know, say right off the bat, I am not a politician. I am a successful small businesswoman. I led a successful nonprofit that filed a federal lawsuit and led to major civil rights wins right here in San Diego and saved over 2,000 jobs, most of them first responders and police. As I sit here, I'm very proud that this week I received the endorsement of the San Diego Police Officers Association. Also this week, it was a surprise, I received the endorsement of NBA legend Bill Walton. So that was really cool too. The thing is, is as a successful small businesswoman and anybody in this audience who has to write checks and has to balance the budget, that's what we're expected to do, and yet that's not what our government is doing. And so I'm, it, it's one thing to talk about experience, and then there is a little bit of, of sentiment around San Diego County that as we look around the city of San Diego and we see how much it has declined in just the past five years and so dramatically that we don't want the disastrous policies of what has led to the demise of what was once America's finest city to spread to the rest of the county. And so what I come with is a fresh perspective somebody who hasn't been afraid to stand up for what is right. And for people, really, it had nothing to do with me. I wasn't a first responder. I wasn't a firefighter. I wasn't a police officer. I wasn't a teacher. But I took a principled stand. And so, San Diego, right now, we are at a crossroads. And you have a very important decision to make. And I want to thank you so much for your support and your vote. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. On behalf of the Grossmont Mount Helix Improvement Association, Casa de Oro Alliance, uh, Cuyamaca College, and the League of Women Voters of San Diego, I want to thank the candidates for running for office and attending our forum this evening. And now we can have All right.
And I want to thank you again. Um, you are here tonight, and you are following the League's motto, which is don't be a voter, be an informed voter. So thank you again. Good evening.